All right, before we get started, we always love to do a membership spotlight. Congratulations to David Forrest. He's received his accreditation of completion to becoming a green home, a, a green associate. David took the tried and true pathway to get through the GHI uh, green associate course while also taking uh, uh, the GBS practice quiz at the same time time, which is uh, the way a lot more people are taking to complete their course very easily on his first try. David is hoping to get involved in residential sustainability, is interested in renewable energy systems, emerging materials, and technology, and this was really the way for him to get started. GHI membership offers both the class and the training for free, uh, the practice exams for free, uh, and, you know, the Green Associate is an internationally recognized uh, standard for credentials in sustainability. So you might want to consider um, becoming one. You know, this is who Green Home Institute members are. This is what Green Home Institute members do. And so can you go to our website and consider getting signed up. All right. Well, welcome everyone to solving performance demands using wood fiber insulation. Before we get started, a shout out to our platinum level sponsors, Ream. Reams have heat pumps, water heaters of the future. They take uh, the natural heat out of the air and then use it to heat water with zero emissions up to 400% efficiency. They offer hybrid water heaters with backup electric resistance at 240 vo a volt to ensure hot water all the time, and they have 120 volt systems that quickly replace gas without expensive electrical upgrades. Uh, my mom just installed one, so we're excited to get her winter bills and see how they do. Um, these systems work by pulling heated air th uh, through a filter and it's absorbed by R410A refrigerant using a compressor to heat coils wrapped around the tanks. Uh, there's all sorts of controls for this system for leak detection, controlling the, t uh, the temperature and the time of use program. Inflation Reduction Act tax credits are here and inflation reduction up to $2,000 and tax rebates taking the top off the top uh, off the top are coming to your state. If you don't want to go all uh, heat pump, that's okay. There are standard electric resistance water heaters that still use zero emissions, and they have time of use settings so you can stay off of peak and save energy. Check this all out over at ream.com, heat pump water heaters. And a special thanks to our second tier sponsor, Indo. Storm windows on the inside, yes, up to 20% energy savings, uh, potentially when putting these interior storm systems around uh, your house or your client's projects. Check them out over at Indo Window. All right, again, solving performance uh, uh, demands using uh, wood fiber insulation. This course is brought to you by the Green Home Institute. The Green Home Institute is a nonprofit with a mission to empower people to make healthier and more sustainable choices in the renovation and construction of the places we live. We're a small but mighty team. I'm the education manager here. My name is Brett Little, and I'll be your moderator today. As all of our courses, this one is approved for multiple continuing education units, including our certified green home professional designation under the health materials and energy pillar. AIA health, welfare, and safety may make it applicable to your state-based design or contractor license. Check out the FIAS code at the end. You'll receive your passive house consultant CUs uh, at the end of this course. All right. Well, I am uh, super excited to have our speaker back on, Dan Edelman. Dan, I think it's now the maybe fourth time or so you've been yeah. on our show under wearing a different hat, but always talking about uh, insulation and building performance. So we're really excited to have you back, Dan, and uh, uh, welcome, and uh, please take it away. All right. Thank you, Brett. And thank you, everybody, for joining today. Uh, my name is Dan Edelman. I'm going to go ahead and just share my screen. And so basically, I'm going to be talking about solving performance demands using wood fiber insulation. Uh, I'll be going over uh, quite a bit, but there is a, a QR code right on the initial screen right there. That's going to just basically get you set up for any newsletters that we're putting out there. So that's Timber HP. Um, I am the business development manager. I cover the Mid-Atlantic, Midwest, and then any surrounding areas as well. So uh, from design all the way to the build, the construction, you know, I get my hands dirty. I'm installing this product uh, with builders, contractors, 
and anybody else that really wants to, uh, you know, get their hands a little dirty with some wood fiber. So today I'm basically going to be going over uh, the current insulation market. What is wood fiber? Uh, some code compliance. And then also I'm going to be talking about some of the embodied carbon and wood fiber insulation. So the current insulation market, and that's actually a great project uh, with using wood fiber uh, rigid board on the exterior as a continuous insulation. Um, so what you could see basically, you know, building codes are changing. That's also increasing the demand for different insulations out there on the market. Uh, right now, continuous insulation is definitely going to be more of a uh, uh, code that we're going to be seeing pretty much from climate zones four on up. So this is something that just getting, it's going to be a better assembly at the end, uh, really protecting against thermal bridging. So that's a big positive, I think, for everybody uh, in the country. So when we start talking about some of the insulations that are currently out there, you know, there really has not been a new insulation product in the U.S. market for probably about 50 years. Right now, the U.S. market is a $50 billion insulation market, and this is kind of how they break down. So you can kind of see from fiberglass, that's going to be the main one. They really began back in like the 1940s as a economical way of insulating a home. So that's going to take most of it. That's going to be bat and a blowing product, about 56% of that $50 billion market. Then foams and plastics, that's, that's been increasing over the years, and that's going to be about 35%. And then mineral wool is about 4.7% uh, or 5%. Uh, right now, wood fiber insulation really is not even uh, in the U.S. market, we are importing it from Europe uh, through different distribution partners. Uh, and that's something that basically we'll be getting more into in the production process. So some of the other differences of the product, you know, fiberglass, like I said, started in like the 1940s. Uh, foams and plastics, 1950s. Mineral back in 1937. Uh, cellulose was about 1950s, and then uh, denim or other, you know, insulations really started pop popping out in the 1970s and 1980s. When you start looking at different codes, and actually this already has changed, so you could see the attic insulation, that's now going to be an R60 in most of the climates that you guys are, are calling in from. Uh, you know, in, in Texas and the south, it's going to be slightly less than that. And one of the biggest benefits for having like a wood fiber insulation in an attic is really for the heat drive, uh, just because it is a, you know, it increases thermal lag on the product. But again, I'm going to get more into that as well. When you start looking at the codes, this is basically what it is going to be, uh, or if it hasn't already changed in your local market. So you can kind of see the continuous insulation is becoming a deal. Uh, a big deal in a lot of them. And one thing that I'm very excited about um, is the, you can now do it with only continuous insulation. So if you're in, you know, the Southern areas, you could go with a, just a 10. So the zero plus 10, that first number being the cavity insulation, the second number is your continuous insulation number. So that plus 10 is gonna be uh, basically like a two and a half inch board on the exterior of your home and that's it, leaving the interior cavity wide open for your MEP and everything else. So this is something that as an insulation company, I've always had a lot of conversation about and people always say the word, you know, houses need to breathe. Well, the houses don't actually need to breathe. The walls need to dry out. And that's when we start looking at some of these codes, you're gonna find that they're not actually having enough in terms of ratio, uh, quoting from Joe Stebrick's uh, BSC uh, 101 or 100, BSI 100 article, uh, you could get kind of look at the ratios, but when you're only putting an R5 in a northern climate with an R20, you're going to find that there's still going to be a condensing surface in that assembly, which can then create mold and mildew in that wall assembly. One thing with timber board, I'm sorry, uh, wood fiber insulation board, uh, it's vapor permeable. So something that I've always talked about, vapor open, airtight. So really just allowing your wall assembly to dry out in both directions while still uh, being able to be a healthy environment for, your, for the people that are living there. 
So these are some of the vapor barrier. This is another question I get quite often is the vapor barrier. So as you start increasing in continuous insulation, the need for a class one vapor barrier, which is really just your polyethylene plastic, uh, that's basically gonna be negated. Uh, my goal is always to get into that class three or just latex paint on your drywall and that's gonna be your class three, but that's really by reducing that condensing surface on the exterior. Um, I'm not gonna go too much into the vapor profiles at this point, um, but when you start looking at what codes uh, are based on climate zone, you can kind of see from, from here what climate zone you are. I believe most people on here are five and six, so they are recommending even a class one vapor, uh, vapor barrier. Uh, so that polyethylene plastic, the issue there is now we are all using air conditioners and with that drying potential in the inward uh, direction in the summer months, which now it's getting hotter uh, than ever before, and we're all using air conditioners, now we're really eliminating that drying potential to the inside in the summer months in the northern climate. Uh, now, one thing with, with uh, wood fiber insulation, and that's when we start talking about vapor uh, hydroscopic and hydrophobic. So our interior bat and fill product, we do have a loose fill product, uh, that's going to be hydroscopic. That's going to aid in hydric buffering and redistribution. So it's going to actually absorb moisture and then redistribute that evenly throughout that cavity and then eventually dry out. Uh, I actually have a couple of our bat samples out back. And what I think I've found is we just had the heavy rain in Pennsylvania and the most of the Northeast, and it's already dried out. And that was about a day and a half ago. So it dries out very quickly. Whereas the rigid board, that's going to be hydrophobic. So we do treat that with a paraffin wax, and that's going to basically aid in that hydrophobic, but still become vapor permeable. So it's able to still dry out. So let's talk more about wood fiber insulation and what it really entails. So some of the basics of wood fiber, first I'll talk about the products that are actually going to be out there. So it's going to be a fill product. So that's a loose uh, dense pack or blow-in product uh, for like an attic application. Then there's going to be bat, uh, very similar to like a mineral bat. And then also a board that's going to be a rigid board, uh, uh, 10 to 15 PSI based on the thickness going to range from half an inch all the way up to about a nine inch board. So very, very thick. Uh, it's carbon storing. So, and I have a video later on the carbon uh, impact as well, um, but it's also high performance. It's not going to, you know, dimensional stability for wood is actually quite high. So it's not going to shrink or expand with uh, temperature changes or anything else. It's also highly recyclable. Uh, we are actually just taking the wood chips from the, the lumber mill industry, so we're not actually uh, cutting any trees down to get the wood. It's non-toxic, it's wood. Uh, and it also, depending on the product, and our goal is to get all of our products to be a class A fire rating, um, but basically that's the ASTM E84 test that we tested through. And so the bat and the fill right now, which is what we produce so far, uh, that's going to be a class A uh, flame spread. So many ask me, at least, uh, why wood fiber? Uh, wood is a, most, a very abundant resource in North America in general, and 99% of the homes in North America are actually built from wood. So it really is a true, uh, a product that really just fits in with the need. So instead of using a glass product or a mineral wool or anything else or foams and plastics, it really does, it's very, um, it's very similar to the wood that you're currently building it. We do treat the, the, the product with a borate. Uh, so it's actually more, uh, it's better with like fire sound uh, and uh, mil mold and mildew and also bug to turn as well. Uh, you know, so we do treat it with that. And then it really makes sense for basically any application. The only application that I'd be very hesitant on using it is obviously below grade exterior. Uh, you don't want to bury it. It is still at the end of the day, a wood product. Uh, and because we, there's no uh, pressure treated wood chips out there, we really aren't going to be having any kind of source for a, uh, a below grade application. 
Um, but there's other applications that I'll show you in a little bit too, that you can still get by with a interior uh, strategy for continuous insulation. So the European wood insulation market, this basically the European products have been around for about 20 to 30 years. It's honing in on a $1 billion industry over there. There's 15 different manufacturers. It's a big deal in Europe. Uh, you know, this is something that has been around. It's been tried and tested. The early history of wood fiber actually dates back to the 1930s in Europe, but never really took ground until about 20, 30 years ago. Uh, and it's also a more premium product over there. And I'll go through some of the pricing in a little bit, what we're kind of looking at uh, coming out with. And we do have uh, the fill product already in the state of Michigan and surrounding areas as well. So the processing, like I said before, we're actually taking the waste wood or the byproduct from the lumber mill industry. So in the state of Maine, there's a tremendous amount of uh, softwood production uh, with dimensional lumber. So two by fours, two by sixes. You'd see in the little image, all the scrap wood that's left over. Uh, they're already debarked and everything. That's what they do for the process of that. So there's no bark in our product. Uh, they basically just take these wood chips. They, we wet it, we shred it. Then we dry it back down to about a 6% moisture content. Uh, and then we basically add in a liquid borate so it's not a dry borate. So like versus like a cellulose where that dust that you see when you're blowing it, a lot of that is actually going to be from the dry borate that's added. Whereas a wet, uh, wet applied borate is going to absorb into the fibers. So it makes it ultimately less dusty. And the dust that is there is actually sawdust. And that's going to drop out of the, the, uh, the air much quicker than, than a powder. Um, so that's basically the process when you get into like the bat and the board, You'd see some of those rollers and a little bit of heat. Uh, the, that's basically just going to be, you know, compressing the product down. So it's the, the product that we're ending up with is the bat or the board, depending on the thickness. I would also like to add that our facility up in Madison, Maine, uh, is hydroelectric powered. So we're actually pulling it from practically right across the dam. Uh, we're one Madison Main or one Main Street. So the town was actually built around the uh, factory. And that factory was an old paper mill that went out of business back in 2016. And in 2019, we actually uh, bought it and have been uh, increasing production or building the production equipment needed for wood fiber insulation and still hiring back actually quite a few people that were working in that paper mill uh, facility, which is really quite, quite awesome for myself. You know, personally, I really like that benefit and talking to some of the people in the production team, you know, they're very, um, they're very happy about, you know, working in this facility because it was one of the nicest, most state-of-the-art facilities in the state of Maine when it was producing uh, product. So Maine is an abundant uh, lumber source. Like I said, you know, we're pulling from uh, sustainably grown um, certified timberlands. So it is, you know, not anything. We're not cutting down trees again. It's uh, just literally the byproduct from the lumber mill. And then when you start looking at the total U.S., we also have a lot of other uh, potential areas to build potential factories. So you could see a lot of the woodlands that are out there and a lot of the lumber industries. Uh, we could basically pull from any, any of those. And because the paper mill are going out of business now, you know, because there's a less need for paper. Uh, we're finding that a lot of the uh, mills or the wood chips are actually unaccounted for and now going into a landfill. So we're hoping to change that in the market. So this is, again, this is our Madison plant up in Maine. This is kind of where we're looking at price points. Uh, the fill, and I, uh, we're working with a couple installers in the state of Michigan in uh, Ohio, uh, Missouri, basically all over the country so far. And what we found is the, the, the fill product is going to be very comparable to like a cellulose. Um, the board product should be about a little bit less than like a mineral wool board. Even with XPS, again, I know that the foam products are very, uh, they differentiate depending on what market that you're actually in. So I know like polyiso is going to be big difference, whether you're in Minnesota or if you're in Texas. 
Uh, the bat products, we're going to be basically right between the mineral bats and fiberglass. So that's going to be more heavily uh, uh, changed by logistics. So it costs quite a bit of money to ship from Madison, Maine. And just like some of the other insulation materials, we can't actually compress the bats too much. So shipping a full truckload is, you know, less square footage on a truckload, but you know, you get a better product that's going to bounce back uh, and you're going to get that true R value. So some of the areas that you could insulate and some of the bat products that we're going to have are R values, because that's one question that we get. So for an exterior wall, we have a R14 and there's also going to be an R22. And then in an attic, we have R30 bat. Uh, that's not going to be available for a little while still now, but the bat should be coming out in about uh, February. So it is a drop-in replacement. It's friction fit. You could put it up, you know, as long as you're going to put drywall up on that ceiling or, you know, tongue and groove, vapor control layer, whatever it might be, that's what's going to hold it in there for that application. It is uh, a friction fit. Um, also below grade, I'm sorry, I missed that. Below grade, uh, we do have applications and we're going to be coming out with the full builder guide. And this is basically going to show, this was written with us and Joe Stiebrick. Uh, I know a couple of you guys might actually know Joe out there, uh, but we're basically looking at below, uh, on top of a slab, uh, interior wall, like I said, in a foundation wall system. Uh, and that's going to be a PSI of about 15 for the uh, compressive strength. So it's going to be pretty high as, uh, as far as compressive strength. Uh, where we're kind of finding that we're focused on at least, uh, obviously CLT, it's kind of a, a shoe in, it's wood, it's wood. Uh, so it goes together very well there, but also, you know, single family residential homes, we have multifamily homes. Basically right now we're focused on the, you know, wood frame market, you know, it really does fit in. We do have uh, fire testing now available for one hour and two hour ratings for both steel stud and uh, wood stud, uh, even load bearing on the wood stud walls as well. So our loose fill insulation, when you start looking at uh, applications, like I said earlier, attic, blow-in product, dense pack, uh, it's an R3.8 per inch when it is blown in. When you start talking attics, you know, when you start looking at R60, it's going to be denser at the bottom than at the top. So it's actually going to change in R value based on that. So near the bottom, it'll be closer to that dense pack R3.8 uh, per inch. And then as it gets up to the top, it could be as, you know, about 3.5 per inch. Uh, but overall, and we have a lot of uh, documents out there that basically show how much to blow in R60, you're looking at about 20 inches. To start with, that's going to settle down to 18.1 inches. Uh, typically with blowing in, just so then your insulation contractor doesn't have to come back to the job site, I always recommend going a little more than the 20 inches even. And worst case, you just get higher R value in that assembly. Then when you look at our BAT product, uh, this is going to be, like I said, it's going to be very similar in feel as like a mineral BAT. This is going to be an R4 per inch. So we're going to have in a, we're going to have an acoustic bat as well. Uh, and I'm going to go into some of the acoustics in a little bit, but that's going to be a three inch bat. Then a three and a half inch bat is an R14, a five and a half inch bat R22, uh, steel stud six inch, and then seven and a quarter uh, we're going to have as an R30. And then this is just one thing that we get tested on a lot is the fire. And this is simply the borate. So you'll notice right now, it's basically just going to be like Shoshogi Ban. Uh, it's going to blacken. It's going to, you know, you're seeing the flame, but it's going to die down as soon as uh, Edith here takes away the torch. So that's really solely for the, for the, uh, the fire testing, ASTM E84. It's not going to actually carry that flame and it's going to extinguish itself. So you see the smoke, it is a light colored smoke. So versus like a foam or a plastic that's going to burn uh, with a very toxic smoke. Uh, one thing I always say with these fire applications, you know, it's going to slow down the spread of the fire. You still don't want to be hanging out in your house if you have an active fire in your house. You want to either A, put it out, or B, call the fire uh, department. Uh, when, you, when we start talking about our, our continuous insulation board, the wood fiber insulation, uh, we have both a square edge that we're coming out with and a tongue and groove. 
Uh, nice thing about the tongue and groove, it's going to be more airtight than just a regular square edge product. Uh, these products are going to go from one inch all the way up to, or actually half inch, all the way up to nine and a quarter inches, which is an R34 on the exterior. So that's a very thick wall assembly. But I know many of you guys out there right now are probably working on either a passive house or anything else. And based on climate, you might find the need to go up that thick. Like I said earlier about the dimensional stability, it's going to be less needed if you're going with, let's say, four or five inches to do double layers because it's not going to shrink or expand the way that other products will. Um, it's also hydrophobic and vapor, vapor permeable. So based on thickness at one inch thick, we're at a perm rating of 40. So that's very high. Um, you can kind of see the durability. Uh, these guys were using it as steps going in. And then this is just a quick little water test. Uh, we have this up at, at our mill and at our trade shows. So we're going to be at a bunch of trade shows moving forward. And you'll be able to actually see this at IBS, JLC, uh, and many other regional shows as well. So that's basically the bulk water demonstration. Um, it also helps manage moisture, you know, in that wall cavity. So because it's hydroscopic, if you do happen to get, you know, a polar vortex or something happens and you do have condensation on your sheathing layer, you're still able to actually, it's going to absorb that moisture and then redistribute it. So wood fiber insulation, what's really neat, uh, it actually can hold up to 15% of its weight in moisture. And then it basically redistributes that moisture throughout the entire assembly throughout the entire uh, bat or fill product and then dry out uh, pretty quickly too. Um, now, typically, you know, you're not getting a polar vortex. So when you start looking at, at that kind of uh, portion of it, it's kind of a rare thing. So we're not designing for that. When we look at woofy analysis and how much continuous insulation, so then you don't have that, that condensation uh, or the, the phase change material like the OSB or the plywood in that, that assembly, uh, you know, you're going to have enough. So you're not going to actually have any bulk or any moisture in there. If you do a bulk water leak, the biggest issue is you have a leak in your house. Uh, you do need to fix that. We do not recommend having this product just like your timber frame or your, uh, your wood frame construction uh, being exposed to water uh, frequently and a lot of it, so over that 15%. So also, you know, insulation for all seasons, this is something that we're talking more about. It's not just about keeping the, uh, the warm air inside of your house, but it's actually also about keeping the warm air or hot air um, outside of your house. So same kind of thing. It does have a low thermal conductivity and very high heat capacity as well. So when you do have those, you know, delta, you know, delta T days of 50 degrees when you're, or delta swings that go from, you know, 85 degrees down to 35 degrees, our product is actually going to be much more stable and it's going to uh, ramp up and ramp down much slower. So, and then this is just a uh, quick video. And this basically just shows a heat lamp that's turned on and you can kind of see what happens. So especially when you start talking roof assemblies, uh, you know, I see some people from Texas on here, you know, this is really gonna help slow down that heat transfer through the material. You can see the graph with uh, the, the uh, uh, wood fiber insulation board, XPS and mineral fiber as well. Uh, so you could kind of see what that ended up as. You could see 114 degrees uh, 87 degrees on the wood fiber and then 115 degrees on the, on the mineral wool board. So it does, you know, take longer for that heat transfer to move through a building. And that's just thermal lag, thermal diffusion, you know, many of those terms. And then ultimately, you know, it's a wood product. So it's really, you know, we're into healthy people, uh, and this is something that we're really talking about, the vapor open assemblies, you know, you're going to have less chance of mold and mildew in that wall on the back of your vinyl wallpaper if you're in the southern areas, uh, you know, many areas, and it's also a natural product. So it's not off-gassing or anything into the indoor air quality. So you're really getting a very good um, indoor air quality when using uh, wood fiber insulation in general. 
Uh, one thing that I've noted from a lot of the insulation contractors that we have actually blowing in the product, A, they love the smell of the product. It smells like lumber, so it's very, very good. Um, the other part is really going to be uh, the installers like the dust, how it settles quicker. And ultimately, it's healthier for the installers themselves. It's also really, really good for... Um, for trap uh, for acoustics, and I'll kind of get into that right now. So you can kind of see the wood fiber. Uh, this is a steel frame assembly. Um, if you look at the actual assembly, it's going to be uh, you know just regular two by four with resilient channels. You're looking at the mineral wool. It's going to be basically an SDC rating of 45, and the same exact assembly using wood fiber insulation. We've tested it with uh, the fill product and the bat. Uh, STC rating of 53. Um, then when you get into the wood, uh, this is for a two by six uh, wall assembly. The two by four STC for mineral wool is about a 47 and STC of wood fiber insulation is 50. And that's really surely from the, the density and mass of the material itself. We're at about a three pound density, uh, 2.8 to 3.1. So it's just gonna add more density and mass into your wall cavity. Uh, the two by six, if you're doing a two by six wall cavity, it's gonna be the same as that mineral wool at 53 STC rating. Um, so it's just wood. Uh, there's, you know, it's basically just soft wood. We're not using any of the hardwood products. We're finding also that the species of wood make a quite a big difference. So we've, uh, we began using uh, pine, fir, uh, I'm sorry, pine, uh, spruce, and hemlock. We've since removed the hemlock for at least the, the blow-in product because it does get a little more fibrous. So we found that more pine will actually reduce the dust. And so we're still honing in that, that uh, fill product, but now it's getting to the point where it's very, very uh, consistent and clean. Uh, that's the other part, you know, it's a post-manufacture product versus a post-consumer product. Uh, whereas like a cellulose will be a post-consumer. So we're very, you know, we're able to be much more selective on the material going in and ultimately you're getting a more consistent, uh, better product at the end of the day. It's also can be handled without any wearing gloves. There's no irritants in it. Uh, I do still for, especially like the bat products and when you're touching other things, you do still want to put on some gloves. I also recommend a, uh, you know, a, a, a N95 dust mask, a nuisance mask just to keep any fibers from getting out of your lungs and also eye protection. With the fill, I like having like more of a full uh, eye protection. So then code, uh, let's get into a little bit of that. Um, you know, US and Canada code compliance. These are some of the, the codes that we are gonna be getting approval on. We are already good for the ICCES for the US market and hopefully soon for the Canadian market. When you start looking at NFPA 285, this is an exterior creep test. Uh, this does, we have not tested yet for being combustible or non-combustible yet. Um, so we haven't done that yet. So right now, if you are using it on an exterior wall, uh, you're gonna probably need a uh, engineering document on that. Uh, but this is really your class one, your type one and your type two. Uh, non-combustible buildings. So when you start looking at the type three to type five, these are all wood frame construction. Like I said earlier, these are an easy in. We do have that one hour and two hour fire rated wall assembly for interior, along with a 50 to 53 STC rating um, on that wall. And then let's get into some of the embodied carbon and just wood fiber insulation. So when we start looking at the embodied carbon, the, the LCA or the life cycle analysis, you know, what we're taking, we're taking basically cradle to grave. Um, a lot of manufacturers will do cradle to gate and other uh, operational energy, um, but we're actually putting in a lot of the, uh, the other information for the production of the process as well, um, instead of just the savings. So right now, 39% of buildings in the US, or I'm sorry, 39% of all CO2 emissions are actually from buildings. Transportation is about 31%. Uh, 
So we need to really get this down. And that's something in AIA 2030, their goal is to really to, to drastically drop these numbers on the CO2 emissions. But it's not just, you know, dropping emissions of the buildings after they're built. It's also looking at the embodied carbon from the building materials when you're actually getting them. So when we start looking at operational energy versus the building materials, you're going to find that because the codes are now greatly increasing insulation layers, and a lot can potentially be coming from foams and plastics, which are high embodied carbon, um, you're going to find that you're actually going to see that the you know, building materials for these projects are also almost at the same level as the operational energy used to heat them, heat or cool them. So this is kind of more on what I was saying about the market share earlier. You know, there's also other issues, off-gassing, highly flammable, vapor closed. You know, I kind of touched on a lot of this, but when we start looking at the numbers for the carbon footprint, wood fiberboard is a negative nine. So it's a carbon negative product. When you start looking at the other ones, fiberglass is still fairly low. Uh, mineral wool, spray foam, XPS, those are gonna start increasing a little bit more. Um, so what you can kind of see too is how that how we're measuring the carbon. So basically the tree, and actually I don't have a video, I'm sorry, um, but basically the trees absorb CO2 their entire lifetime. Uh, they're carbon storing. So as soon as you cut down that tree, that CO2 would initially just typically just off gas right back into the environment. Whereas when we're processing it and putting it into your wall, now you're holding that, that CO2 in your, uh, the wood fiber insulation stores the CO2. That really just helps with that. And when we start getting into calculations, um, you can kind of see the difference. So this is a regular 1500 square foot passive house wall assembly. So much more insulation than a conventional home. Um, but you can see that we're actually saving for this simple two by six wall in a 1500 square foot house about, you know, 3,100 pounds of CO2. So, which is equivalent because I know 3,100 pounds of CO2 doesn't really mean much to anybody or well, at least myself. Um, but when you start looking at driving 7,100 miles, that's quite a bit of CO2 that we're actually saving. Uh, um, or I'm, yeah, so that's just the 3,100, but the 5,600 pounds versus like a, a, another insulation material. So it's even more so. Then when you get into, you know, using the rigid board, it's going to increase it that much more. So this, I believe, is a five and a half inch board. And we're looking at even more savings. So that's equivalent to 23,000 miles. So yeah, total is 24,750 pounds of CO2 by simply just converting over your insulation package. When we start looking at the total building envelope, uh, we're finding that basically uh, concrete is, I think everybody knows, is pretty much the biggest one. There are ways to reduce the amount of concrete. I've been on projects where we basically, and honestly, my own home, I don't have a slab in my crawl space. Um, so basically, that's removing concrete altogether for that. Uh, and then insulation is the number two. So we're finding that with the cost premium being actually negative or being about the same as conventional insulation, you're not really changing the cost of the project, but you're going to ultimately help with that total embodied carbon for that, for that build. Um, then there's the rebar. Uh, that's another one. And then any kind of finished materials and glazing as well. Yep. There it goes. So one thing about Timber HP, um, that's a company that I work for. Uh, we basically stand on three different pillars. So the HP stands for high performance, healthy planet and healthy people. Uh, you know, our founders, uh, uh, Josh and Matt, both are firm on all three of these. You know, this is something that we're really, uh, really working on helping the both the planet, the people that are using the product and living in the homes but also increasing high performance and having it so you're losing 
less uh, energy throughout the year. And then when we get into some of the products, uh, we have the timber fill. And that, like I said earlier, is that's going to be something that's actually available right now. Uh, you could go out to your insulation contractor, lumber yard, uh, insulation distributor, um, and actually purchase that right now. Uh, same, similar price as cellulose. So that's pretty good. It's going to depend on what market that you live on, uh, live in and shipping costs. But for the most part, it's very similar to that. The timber bat, we're actually rolling it right now. We're going through all the testing, the mold and mildew testing, uh, some of the ASTM E84 tests as well. Uh, and we're able to actually be coming out with that. Uh, you should have no issues finding it in early February, uh, but we're really going to start push, pushing it into distribution in mid-January. So even as early as that, we're going to have that product on the shelf. Um, and then timber board, which is going to be um, we're actually kind of cool story about the timberboard line, but basically we, uh, we, there was a wood fiber insulation manufacturer in Europe um, amongst the 16 that were, or the 15 others that were there, but they were also producing other products. They said, you know what, there's enough production here. We're not going to do this. They sold us the, the equipment for the board line. And right now we're building that board line in. It's kind of like barnyard builders. So if you're familiar with that show, where they're basically taking all the different pieces, numbering them, and then they shipped it overseas. And now we're constructing that in the mill right now. So we're looking at having the square edge um, probably by the end of Q1, probably closer to like April. Um, but again, with there's still some uncertainty on the product, how it's going to come out. The timber fill was a little bit more of a struggle getting the fiber right. And the timber fill is basically what feeds the timber bat and the timber board line as well. Um, so those products are all going to be available by, you know, July of, of next year. Um, so yeah, uh, Brett, that's pretty much all that I had. I know I went through a lot there. Yeah. Yeah. Great. No, uh, thanks. And we've got a lot of questions coming in, so we'll have some time to, oh, awesome. to, to uh, yeah, to get to those questions before we get to them just real quick. Uh, I do want to remind everyone that, yes, we are recording this session. So if you want to rewatch it, share it with a friend or a colleague, uh, catch anything you might have missed. You can go to our YouTube channel. You can click subscribe now or check back in the next couple of weeks or uh, days and you should see it. Uh, for those of you watching this in the future, but not right now on demand, make sure to take that quiz with an 80% passing rate and you'll receive your certificate. And for those of you watching this right now, as long as you're here for the entire CEU approved hour and you're appropriately logged into Zoom with the name you want printed on your certificate, you should be able to check your spam over the next couple of days for certs at gutenbergcerts.com and then receive uh, your continuing ed certificate. Um, and as always, we need to say a huge thanks to our volunteers, our executive director, Jose Reyna, our board of directors, our volunteers, and all of our sponsors, especially our top tier sponsors, Mitsubishi and Reem, who support all of our work and allow us to do these sessions and do um, what we do. So I'm going to go to the top here. Um, you had talked about um, additives for fire protection. And so the question is, with a lot of these additives, how does that impact uh, recyclability and disposal. So with the borate, it is a natural product. Uh, it actually aids in reducing, um, it's a soil, uh, amendment, uh, amendment additive that, that farmers use anyway to reduce the amount of bugs that are in the, in the soil, right. but it actually aids in the, the wood fiber will actually break down uh, in a landfill. So exposed to the elements, you know, with the heat and everything else kind of happening in a landfill, it will actually break down. And so will, will the borate. Right. Um, what is the, um, weight, um, of this product compared to cellulose or, um, you know, other material, other insulation? It's pretty much very similar. Uh, yeah. coverage rates are going to be the same the weight of the bag is going to be the same, the weight of the uh, installed product. So if you're concerned about like drywall, you know, having 48 inch on center, 
you know, you might need to rebrace it, but that's all, you know, you'd want to strap that ceiling anyway. So then you add some of that, uh, uh, the strength to that ceiling, but the span of the drywall, I should say. Um, but yeah, probably 24 inch on center, you're not going to have any issues with weight. When you start getting really thick, you know, R100, R120, you know, that's when you just want to get the weights and everything, pass it off. If you're doing 16 or 24, I don't see an issue. But if you're going even more uh, stud spacing or joist spacing on that, I would definitely get an engineer just to kind of sign off on it. Mm -hmm. um, a great comment in here from uh, an affordable housing a developer right here in Michigan who's looking at switching over to using uh, wood fiber products. So that's pretty cool. So thanks for sharing that. Um, uh, masonry uh, walls, obviously they're a thorn in all of our sides, uh, brick walls, as yeah. far as insulating and retrofitting projects. Uh, what can you talk to us a little bit about that and what we can do? <laughs> yeah, I mean, for those, it really depends. Uh, yeah. If you're looking at covering over the masonry, uh, you know, that's an option. You could definitely yep. do that. Brick, as everybody knows, it's vapor permeable. Yep. So you're not really changing the vapor profile. If anything, you're going to move that, that dew point further out in that wall when you're using continuous insulation. If you want to keep the brick, you could definitely do interior strategies. Again, because it's not a vapor barrier, you're not changing the, the profile. So you can go interior with like a, a board product or, you know, bat or loose fill product um, in the cavities. Okay. Um, any need for a drainage plane behind the product or between the front face of the product and exterior cladding? So when we started talk going down the road with Joe Stebrick, uh, he brought that up. Uh, that's something that we're, I'd say, best practice. We recommend having like a 132nd or one uh, 16th inch drainage gap behind, not a rain screen or anything behind the board. Mm -hmm. uh, when you start looking at all your flashing details, you definitely want to have your flashing details in front of the board and not behind the board, uh, which is honestly every other insulation, uh, mm -hmm. continuous insulation out there as well. Right. You want to keep as much bulk water out in front. Um, you know, RDH did some uh, uh, testing on open jointed cladding with yeah. continuous insulation and only 1% moisture water got behind the insulation board, even with open jointed cladding. So for the most part, it's going to stay outboard. Um, question came in, I'm curious about the use in cathedral cavities between rafters. Can the rigid board be used for the vapor impermeance against the roof sheathing with the dense pack loose fill or bats then below? Yeah, no, it is vapor permeable. So if you are looking at doing that vent, you know, we do recommend a vented system. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you're looking to do the vent with the rigid board, we would recommend doing um, either the rafter vents or something else. You'd also look at hybrid assemblies where you're actually putting the board on top of the roof. And then if you're, you know, a strapping on top and then a metal roof on top of that. So you're, you're keeping the air actually on the exterior of the building envelope versus bring it in but yeah in terms of uh vapor impermeable that's something that we probably wouldn't recommend and it, honestly it probably does also depend heavily on the climate zone too so if you're in climate zone one through i'm going to say three maybe four yeah. uh there's really low risk in having you know having a vapor permeable product there mm -hmm. um but it is still going to be very vapor permeable. I would also recommend using like a uh, an, uh, responsive vapor control. So your smart yeah. membranes or whatever you want to call those um, on the bottom side, if you did go that route. Um, so question here and always appreciate a shout out to everyone who's got allergies to trees. Yeah. Uh, and you know, it's a good question because mm -hmm. I put this in my house. I have awful tree allergies. Is this going to affect me? Um, so I think that honestly, I think the biggest thing I found that many people that had, like we had somebody on site, uh, and they were actually allergic to hemlock. Mm. Uh, the product that we were currently using had hemlock in it. He had zero reaction to it. Um, but that being said, I would definitely want to, you know, get the product before it's installed in front of them just to see, 
uh, if they, you know, again, we're only using pine and uh, spruce and honestly reach out to myself or uh, Timber HP folks. And we can tell you by batch what species were in each one. We are not using cedar. I know in the state of Texas, the cedar uh, season is quite, quite bad for allergies and we're not using any cedar in the product. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so talking about installers and I'm gonna add a little bit to this question. Um, you know, obviously from a labor standpoint, getting uh insulation installers depending on where you are it's it it just seems to be getting harder and harder and harder and so obviously introducing something new and the mm -hmm. training that's required and the effort on compounding on top of the worker shortage we're dealing with in this industry mm -hmm. um you know how are we addressing that is that going to just significantly jack up costs just to get people trained or the sort of, I don't want to do it fee, right? I'm going to keep doing what I normally do. How do you mm -hmm. convince installers to do more when they're, you know, short staffed? Um, and I know you're not going to solve all that in two minutes, but <laughs> just speak a little bit to it. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, so right now we found a couple installers do put a premium um, on the install because they're really just unsure mm -hmm. uh, of what they're going to find. One thing that, that myself and my team uh, offer is actually install training. So we'll go to their, their facility and actually just get a couple bags of the, of the fill and just put it through the machine and show them that. But typically in terms of labor and the, the speed, it should be the same exact as cellulose. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's, and, and yeah. Yeah. Um, question uh, is, uh, Wood fiber uh, suitable for exposed concrete foundations on the interior of the envelope? Yes. So you could use it below grade as long as you don't have an active uh, water leak into that assembly. You're not going to have any issues. You could even put it below grade like in a basement on top of the slab. Uh, and again, you could put two layers of three quarter inch plywood or, or OSB on top of that system just to lock the two layers together. And then uh, you could even tile on top of that. Um, so can you can reconfirm again for us quickly, the R values, just so someone wanted mm -hmm. to make sure they had the R values, right? So R, uh, for dense packing, it's R 3.8 for attic. It's about, and again, we have a guide, so it's going to differ, like I said, but between like figure 3.6 in the attic, uh, and then for the, uh, timber bat, it's R4 per inch. So R14, R22. And eventually we will have an R30 that's going to be later down the road. Um, and then the board is going to range from 3.4 to 3.8, uh, depending on thickness, because again, we could reduce density as we get really thick and that'll ultimately increase the R value. Right. Um, so a question here about essentially getting rid of the sheathing and just using this structurally, is that possible? Um, you would definitely need an engineer to do that, but it is possible. I mean, they're building houses with, you know, only one side of sheathing right now. Hmm. Um, and just putting tie back over, trust me, I've seen it, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, certain markets in, in the country, I'm not going to name them, but, uh, yeah, it's just tie back on two by fours and vinyl siding. So you could definitely, you know, you'll need to structurally brace the walls. Um, I would assume, but again, we have all the details on the, on the board. Interesting. I was not expecting that answer. So yeah. <laughs> thanks for the question. Um, uh, uh, and then speaking, well, continuing on with our kind of strength conversation, uh, is the wood fiber strong, board strong enough to support a large window as an insulating window buck? Um, that detail, I would, I'm questioning why the insulation would be inboard on that window. I guess it's depending on what kind of window it would be, because if you have insulation up to the bottom of the window, that's insulating that, that two by six that you're setting your window on top of. Um, that again, we need to look at the weight of the window and see it. It's a 15 PSI strength 10 to 15 depending on thickness but again i think there's other strategies to insulate that 
that install. If you're looking at the, I guess the other option is if you're pulling it out and doing a window buck system, um, there are ways that you could actually insulate the buck, um, go behind or, you know, go behind with the board and then a two by four and then install the window right to that. But again, a lot of the window manufacturers aren't going to approve that for their warranty. And that's been kind of the, what I've heard quite a bit when doing that application. So the window manufacturers won't, even though technically it could work. Mm -hmm. Um, because you would want to install the screws all the way back to the stud, to the, not just to the um, window buck. Okay. So. Um, another question that came in was, um, curious again on the board product in an exterior insulation setting, do you recommend the WRB outboard of the board? Um, like other types of wood fiber manufacturers or does the paraffin negate this need? So the paraffin does negate that need. Uh, we are uh, going to be trying to get, we're going to be putting borate in the board. So it'll be molded and mildew resistant as well. Um, good to see Peter on here, by the way, Peter from uh, Harbor Springs. And uh, I'd also want to add that you could put the WRB in either location. So you could go behind or in front of the board. Hmm. Um, the, some of, a lot of the, the fully adhered or the peel and stick WRBs will stick on the board. Uh, you know, we've tested a few manufacturers, some are better than others, um, but you could really go with either strategy there. Mm -hmm. um, going, shifting to the embodied carbon real quick, mm -hmm. um, some of the claims you're making, negative carbon, um, fantastic. Uh, are EPDs available? Are those coming out? Yep, they'll be coming out. Uh, we need a one year of production time to basically uh -huh. average in that entire year for the EPDs. So you'll be seeing those basically a year after we started production on Timberfill, a year after we started production on Timberbat, and same thing with board. But right now we're using the European uh, EPDs and the LCAs and everything. Uh, mm -hmm. So we have those. We find that we're going to be maybe even a little better because we're using hydroelectric power. Uh -huh. um, and about 90% of the um, electricity used, 90 to 95% of the electricity used in the mill, in the factory, is coming from that hydroelectric power. Okay. What percent of the overall carbon of the product even comes from electrical production, do you know? Is it, I mean, it, is it a pretty high? It's not that, much. That, it okay. doesn't take much energy at all. Yeah. You know, we're the, so. the when we're getting into like the heating portion of it, the highest heat that we actually have is 150 degrees Celsius, and that's the baking of the bat to push the the binder basically and have that spread out through the bat. Right. Um. Do you have um any uh, uh wall assembly details to that need to be done to obtain? the product warranty? Is that something that's going to be forthcoming in this builder's guide you're mentioning? Um, no. So we're not going to be really warranting the whole assembly, but the products do have a limited warranty on product defects and, you know, typical things like that. We are also looking at the R value um, warranty. Uh, but basically right now, you know, the warranty is as make basically make sure that you don't have any defects, product defects on the manufacturing portion of it hmm. um and uh just be uh you know how long has uh is remind us how long has wood fiber been in in use as a insulation so technically it's been in use for almost 100 years mm -hmm. um really has not caught on for the probably the last 20 to 30 years it's really caught on in the european market though mm -hmm. Um, another question that I see is the, the builder guide, it's mm -hmm. going to be available. We're hoping basically, uh, late January, that's going to be available. It's going to be a 70 page guide available for free on our website. Um, so actually if you sign up for that newsletter, you'll be getting, uh, information on that builder's guide. Mm -hmm. Um, and as you mentioned right now, if I recall, right, um, 
the there's not as far as the United States goes, there's not any wood fiber manufacturing going on, right? There is not. Yeah, I didn't think so. So not that I know of. There might yeah. be a small outfit that I'm not sure of. Sure, sure. Um, well, Dan, we're uh at our time today, so that's good news <laughs> to get awesome. out of time. Yeah. Um, and I don't see any other uh questions right now. So can you just again remind us where people can go to either contact you or learn more about um Timber HP? Yep. So I think everybody has LinkedIn here. So LinkedIn. Uh, Instagram, it's danedelman.timberhp. Uh, and then my email is also, honestly, the best way is going to www.timberhp.com. If you just search wood fiber insulation on Google, more than likely you're going to find that uh, our website and you could go through the contact us and we have somebody monitoring that. Uh, my email is dan.edelman at timberhp.com. Um, so many, many options. I think to, today is the day that, you know, we have many options of communication. So, yeah, yeah, definitely. So, um, well, great. Um, Dan, thank you so much for your time. Thanks to Timber HP. Thank you all for joining us. This was a wrap on 2023 for our session. So we'll catch you all on January 10th for our next one. Uh, have a wonderful holiday season, everyone. Take care and goodbye. Yeah. Happy new year. Happy holidays. Take care. Thanks. Be sure to check out all of our courses available online that you can watch anytime and anywhere to pick up your CEUs. Before you go, make sure to subscribe to us on YouTube to get weekly updates and stay up to date on green building science courses, webinars, and home tours. Thanks again.